We have Mark Wahlberg talks to animals. Now, meet James Corden talks to yetis. We Welcome to a brand new series, Phelan's Big Screen Scenes. Mm, still working on a title. This is where I talk about movies right after I see them in theaters and give them my quick takes. This will maybe encourage you to see or not see a film while it's still on the big screen. Maybe one day, if I have more to say, perhaps I'll give it a play-by-play later. We'll see. Without further ado, Smallfoot. Oh, one more thing. There are no spoilers here. Cool? Cool. Let's cut to it. Smallfoot. Brought to you by the fellas who brought you the Lego movie. Another Lego movie. Another Lego movie. And coming soon, another Lego movie. Oh, and storks. But we see the Warner Animation Group once again step out of their plastic comfort zone to deliver us a story, or rather two stories, about discovering the truth. One being more interesting than the other. The primary story is about a yeti named Migo, living in a conformist world driven entirely by the rules of a controlling leader while everyone is happily okay, unquestioning, and playing their roles in a completely safe environment. But everything changed when something different and shatters his whole reality as he grows to question authority. Where have I seen that before? So Migo comes across what is perceived as a myth, a smallfoot, or a human. So he and some rebellious friends who share the same belief that smallfoots exist compared to the in denial masses, he sets out to find more people like the smallfoot he saw before. And yeah, it's fine and all, yet as I said, we've seen this before. Too many times, and not much is done when it comes to the first act. Nothing is done to differentiate it story-wise. Now don't confuse what I'm saying when it comes to little differentiation with style. This movie is incredibly stylistic and shows me that Warner Brothers has a distinct look. Something to stand out from the crowd, something I'll get into later. But just focusing on story structure and execution, it's as by the book as you can get. They try to rush it out with an incredibly sped up exposition piece to get the basics out from the start, but it still sounds drawn out, hard to comprehend to the average viewer due to its speed, and it just feels lazy. Show, don't tell. On the topic of Smallfoot, as in the humans, though, this is where we meet Percy, a failing wildlife documentary who is looking to desperately profit off hoaxes and lies to become a viral sensation on the internet. It's not what he wants to do, but the industry and how much entertainment has changed, which has caused him to go into such means. Now, though, he gets his big break when meeting Migo, and the two have a surprisingly fun dynamic trying to communicate with each other due to not knowing what they're saying. It's a little rushed at points, but overall, well done. But what I like about this point of view is that an idea like this, from what I can tell, is not done in animated films. While maybe you could use a bit more depth, the idea of a personality trying to get past the struggles of life in the entertainment industry, specifically YouTube trends, is fascinating. It's definitely something I can tell a lot of YouTubers have to go through. They have to profit off of clickbait and bandwagoning to make a living, even if it risks their integrity, which is something pointed out in the film and it delivers a message as to how that integrity pays off. Why don't we have a movie about this guy? It's funny. These sorts of movies, typically, the humans is what holds the film back. They distract you from the fun, supernatural adventures of interesting new characters to stick you back into a reality you're already tired of when there's no need to. Yet, ironically, the humans is what makes Smallfoot interesting once they get involved. Not the cartoonishly charming Yeti, but a human YouTuber. Think about that. That's ironically a trend with Warner, looking back on their biggest hit. The Lego movie, while entertaining, isn't exactly fresh when you start off. But once they bring in the twist with the humans and how all this is a psychological analysis of a neglected child, that's where the brilliance of the film comes into play and why I love it. Smallfoot, while not anywhere near that level of brilliance, the humans is what makes a run-of-the-mill story into something much fresher. The involvement of the humans even make the side of the Yeti culture more investing, as it opens up a darker, relatable part of both human and Yeti alike with clever symbolism and imagery about censorship, war, racism, and other issues comparable to society itself. And that's really all I have to say when it comes to the story without getting into spoilers, I'm already stretching it as is. But this doesn't mean I'm done, as I need to touch on the other aspects of the film. It's hard to see the distinct style that Warner has, due to the majority of their films having to stick to a certain style due to the branding with LEGO. And even though I love the LEGO movie style, you obviously can't pin that to all of your films. Luckily, Storks, and now Smallfoot, shows off that the crew is far more versatile. Smallfoot uses a lot of very squash and stretchy techniques, very similar to old cartoons of the past. In fact, probably derived from Warner Brothers' past, like an homage or something to what they used to do. Uh, I don't know, it's an homage to something, you probably heard of it. It's called Looney Tunes. The expressiveness, the slapstick, the motions, it feels like a modernized Looney Tune, similar to the old CGI shorts they used to do. That's honestly amazing. 
I strongly believe studios, to stand out, need a form of style and identity. Disney's about making timeless tales that will stick to you forever. DreamWorks made their mark through satire, comedy, and parody. Illumination is sort of like Warner with its cartoonish design, but is far more grounded in terms of its motion. Sony also uses the same squash and stretch style and is very close to Warner's. But since Warner is a pioneer on that kind of animation, Smallfoot proves that the original still conquers those imitators. What also surprised me is that despite the marketing not telling me anything about it, the movie is a musical. Or maybe I missed something, but this wasn't what I was expecting. But it was honestly welcomed, as if it was an homage to a sub-series of Looney Tunes, Merry Melodies. Man, with all this, Space Jam 2 really does have potential. I just figured it would just be nostalgia pandering. But when am I getting that back in action sequel? I know it bombed, but do it again. It's smarter than you think, I swear. But one thing that Bugs and his friends have that Smallfoot lacks is comedy. Almost all of Smallfoot's jokes unfortunately fall very flat. I never got more than a slight chuckle, aside from a running gag with one of the side characters that was honestly hilarious because of its use of personality and dialogue. A lot of the humor is based on slapstick, and while that can be done well as that's the basis of Tom and Jerry, it doesn't work well here. And it's not because I'm too old, because again, there's tons of slapstick that's funny that I still enjoy to this day, but in my theater, not a single kid was laughing. It was practically silent. So it's not just me, and the demographic it's targeted to, didn't like it either. The things that do save its comedy from dying on the spot and still keeps the film entertaining was the previously mentioned animation and cast. Seeing the trailer and how many celebrities and singers they got, I had a feeling most performances are gonna fall flat and these actors were brought in just to draw a crowd. But no, for the most part, everyone had a good amount of energy, emotion, passion, and pretty much made me forget that these were celebrities providing the voices. Instead of me hearing, and LeBron James is Gwangi. I just hear Michi and Gwangi. And so I say props for the excellent voice directing. The only kind of actor that I feel is out of place is James Corden as Percy. His voice is definitely distinct and has potential for many different roles. Trust me, I saw him like three times now in animated films this past year. But I feel like he doesn't quite match his character. Especially since Percy is told to once be a nice guy with integrity, and no offense to Mr. Corden, but that voice with the energy he gives to the role doesn't make me think he was a super caring guy at some point. Yet ironically, he made a very compelling kind of man in Doctor Who. I like those episodes with him. If he used that energy at points there, I would be convinced. But then it would feel out of place in this movie. So honestly, he was just a wrong choice. But yeah. Smallfoot was a fun and, dare I say, intelligent ride once you get past the annoyingly predictable first act and lack of laugh out loud moments. I was actually very surprised about how it turned out. I expected it to be a lot more generic. I wouldn't say you should rush out to the theaters and see it, but maybe a Netflix watch, digital rental, or if you really want to see it in theaters, a matinee. But that's about all the time I have for you today. I'll see you next time. Oh, and can you hear the ticking? Zendaya is Michi, and LeBron James is Gwangi, Danny DeVito is Dorgo, Ooh, Common is Stonekeeper, and Zendaya is Michi, Gina Rodriguez is Coca. And today I meet you. Today I meet you.